His hopes dashed. Right there, Santa tells you, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. Uh, David, by the way, just Brian Rice is watching online, and he heard uh, that you fell, and he wanted to say that he was sorry he didn't get to see your interpretive dance today. <laughs> That's kind of the love we have around here. Good to see you this morning. So we're talking about hope today. Let me ask you this question. Today we're going to talk about how to find hope this Christmas, but here's the, here's the thing. Do you ever struggle with worry? Right? That's a dumb question, right? If you're not, maybe you're not, but you have friends that are. Do you have friends that are discouraged? A lot of times we become discouraged because we see fear ahead. We see an obstacle we can't overcome. Or we're living in the past where we remember something and we're hurting over that. And so today what I want to do is just to, to give you a present. We love presents. See, presents give us hope. And he was doing pretty good till Santa kicked him down the slide, right? You know, we look at presents. You know, as you get older and older, you really understand that it's better to give than to receive. Partially because you already got yourself what you wanted, right? Right? Husbands today are asking their wife, what, what, what do you want for... Can you just go buy it? Because... What's awesome about Amazon is I actually get texts that have things in them. Like, I want this. One of my children. I want this. Too bad. When I was a kid, we had, we didn't have Amazon when I was a kid, but we did have the Sears catalog. You remember the Sears catalog? How many of you remember the big old Christmas Sears catalog, right? So my parents had five children, so they couldn't remember what any of us wanted. And my mom loved Christmas. And I never knew why until this year where she told me that they never had Christmas. They did not have gift exchanges. They never had a tree. One year when she was in 10th grade, uh, uh, they, her, her and her sister begged for a Christmas tree. Uh, so my grandfather went out on Christmas Eve, bought a tree. They put it up. They decorated it with popcorn and stuff. And then the next morning, he threw it out. That was Christmas. So my mother loves Christmas. We have two trees set up right now that are hers in our house. It's crazy. Amazon packages are being delivered probably at the moment at our house. By the way, my mother's watching online. So, Mom, I'm so excited that Christmas is happening. <laughs> By the way, I'm also the return guy. So when stuff isn't supposed to come, I'm the one who goes to the store and the guy says, your mom ordered some more stuff? I'm like, yeah, here you go. You take that. So... When I was a kid, though, we had the Sears catalog, and my mom said when I was about four years old, I wanted the Fisher Price dump truck that had the little people in the front, and I just stared at it. Day after day, I would open the Sears catalog to that and just stare at it on the floor of the living room, and my mom said it was so cute, and of course, Christmas Day came, and there under the tree was the Fisher Price dump truck, hope fulfilled. By the way, I still have my Tonka metal, Tonka trucks from when I was a kid. I think my brother threw his away, but we're not going to talk about that right now. If you could give someone any present, anything they asked for, anything that you thought they would need, what would you give them? And today I want to talk about a present that you can give and I'm going to even give you some practical ways that you, this season, not only can renew your hope, but that you can even help to give others hope. Sometimes by telling your story. Sometimes by just going out of your way for them. And being a blessing. There's lots of ways that we can encourage others today. And I want you to be so full of hope that you can give it away. So today we're going to start this journey we call Advent. We're going to start with this idea of hope. Number one, how do we get hope? Scripture gives me hope. Now that's a very basic answer, but let me... Look at Romans chapter 15. Now you got to realize what's happening in this early church. It, it didn't take long for people to become selfish and self-centered. Uh, it's our default, by the way. We, I always joke that we have selfish gravity here on earth. So even if you're a believer and you love Jesus, there's a tendency to go, I love Jesus, leave me alone. Or, I love Jesus, why am I not getting credit for this, right? And so Paul addresses that in the early church by saying this. We, Romans 15, 1, who are strong... Ought to bear with, by the way, this word for bear doesn't mean to put up with. We tend to think, I got to put up with somebody. We think that what Paul means is, you tolerate somebody. No, no. 
This word bear means to pick them up. We who are strong ought to pick up the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, not just so they leave us alone, not just so they're not a pain anymore, right? You know, I'm going to help them just because they're bothering me. That's not what this means. And then he continues, each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. Now, that doesn't mean to enable That doesn't mean to do something for somebody you know hurts them or to allow them to abuse you. This is for their good. Can we open those back doors? I'm not sure how they keep getting shut every single week. Can you tell I've noticed? I did the emphasis. Very pastoral of me. Every single. Do your kids ever talk to you? Your parents ever talk to you that way? Can you take the trash out? You forget. And then what do they say? Every single weak, and you know you're never going to get allowance. All right. For even Christ did not please himself. Thank you so much, Mike. But for even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who've insulted you have fallen on me for everything that was written in the past. So what is the Bible written for? Why is it there? Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, but not just to teach us, it continues, so that through the endurance taught in Scripture, and this is a really cool word, this, this word literally means to, to, and it can mean joyfully, but it means to bear under weight. Weight is put on something and, it, and you hold. It's a bridge that's tested and the bridge holds. It's your life that's tested and it holds. So we look back and we see people that were tested, taught in the Scriptures, and then it says, and the encouragement, which means it gives you courage when you see what they did, that we might have hope. So we look at people like David and we sing a psalm this morning and we understand David not only was under attack many times, but David also failed, probably worse than any of us could. I I really, I mean, maybe you're a murderer, but probably not. I mean, you could be, and then you'd be like, well, I did the same thing. But most of us can be like, well, at least I haven't murdered somebody. David couldn't even say that. God still brought good out of it. Solomon came even out of sin. But the truth is that David had conversations with himself that I'm sure sounded like the ones that you and I have with ourselves. You're a failure. You are no good. You don't matter. How can you call yourself a Christian? David didn't say that one. How can you call yourself a king? How can you call yourself a pastor? How can you call yourself a believer? How can you call yourself a good neighbor? And so we read these stories and it gives us hope because we realize in failure and struggle, there we are. I remember being in the hospital and having a tube down my throat for days, which by the way, is in the top most miserable things you can do, except that they also would not allow me to eat. And worse than that, I thought that was bad until they would not allow me to drink, even have ice chips, even have that little sponge that they put on you. They didn't allow me to have any of that. And I remember in Acts where Paul and Silas were in jail singing. And I thought, if these guys can be in a rat-infested bottom of the basement underneath, by the way, this was pre-sewage, bottom of the basement, think do a little, little thought in your head, and they can sing praises, then, then I can't even hear. If you allow God to, God will use stories in Scripture. Even the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is going through this time of trial in Israel where Israel's basically blown up. Everything is destroyed. Nothing good is happening. They are dragged off to Iraq and, and we say, well, what, do you, what comes out of that? And here's what Isaiah says. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Naphtali. By the way, this sounds like Star Wars, doesn't it? Or Dune, one of the two, all right? And, but in the future, he will honor, listen to this, Galilee. By the way, you remember in the book of John, what the early, one of the early disciples said. They said, hey, here's this guy from Galilee who's awesome. And, and Peter's like, um, or Andrew was like, uh, uh, yeah. What good thing can come from Galilee? Like, that's like Mims. I mean, what good, sorry, Suzanne. What, what good thing, what good thing can come from Bithlow? 
right? Okay, okay. I don't think we have any Bithloites here, so, all right? What good thing could come from Chuliota? Okay, so here we go. He will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, the light has dawned. By the way, we have no idea what it's like to live in darkness. I mean, our power goes out for a second, and now we have a flashlight in our pocket at all times. At all times. And if we don't, we freak out. Everybody see my phone? Call my phone so I can find my phone. But they lived in darkness all the time. Until Rome came, there weren't lighted streets. Until Rome came, there were not lighted cities. You had your own light, every man or woman for themselves when it comes to light. When Rome came, light came. But guess what? Jesus is light to our hearts, no matter what's happening in your life. And so when you're going through struggle, especially this time of year, listen, it's normal to get depressed and discouraged at certain times this time of year. That is normal. You are not weird. You don't have to look at people's faces and go, look, they're all happy and I'm sad. You don't have to do that. That's a lie. Face... Facebook is fake. <laughs> we, were, we were joking in our family about this year's Christmas card. I'll just... I'll just cut and paste everybody into one picture because it's impossible to get everybody together. We have one of our children is in Austria. How in the world am I going to get them in a picture, right? We just, we just put them together and nobody will know. We just throw their faces. I could, I could put my face on somebody who, who looks good. And then you'd be like, man, pastor's really been working out. And I'd be like, no, it's fake. And here's the deal. Everybody struggles. And so take some time to read God's Word when you're struggling. Go in the book of Psalms. I tell people all the time, if you're grieving, the book of Psalms is so good. If you're struggling with anger, the book of Psalms is so good. There's times where David says things that you should not say. But we understand the emotion. Take some time to find a verse that would encourage you. Maybe put it on your wall for this season for you. I had somebody last night tell me, today would have been my husband and my 50th anniversary. I I can't imagine today being happy. But that's okay. You can embrace the misery that life is sometimes and still have hope. And still look ahead and go, one day it's going to be better. One day, and maybe not even on this earth, and that's okay too. One day. In heaven, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more hurt. And those who've gone before us, we can think about them eating together and hanging out together. By the way, I'm assuming there's lots of eating in heaven since that's what Jesus did on earth. They actually called him a partier. If you think about that, that's pretty awesome. Gives you just a little pretest of heaven. Some people this year are dealing with something that feels like a nuclear bomb. You know, the, the news always tries to make you scared. So now they're like, the Chinese have a bomb that we would never detect until it goes off. And some of us are thinking, could you hit Washington first? But we shouldn't say that out loud. All right. So, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) I really don't want that to happen. But anyway, so, but the truth is, right? If that all of a sudden happened, you think toilet paper shortage was bad, right? And, And we don't realize that all the time, listen, there are people all around us that have worse things happening to them. Right now, emotionally, they're struggling with depression. Right now, they're struggling with ending their lives. Right now, they are struggling with a relationship with somebody they don't know how to fix, and they are heartbroken over it. But God's Word brings hope. You read those stories. Listen to what Johnny Erickson Tata, that has spent most of her life in a wheelchair, said. The best we can hope for in this life is a knothole peak at the shining realities ahead. Yet a glimpse is enough. It's enough to convince our hearts that whatever suffering and sorrow currently assail us aren't worthy of comparison to that which waits over the horizon. So this is a truth that if you live in America and your worst problem this week was that the internet was slow. Or that your copy machine did not work. Or that traffic was bad. Wee, wee. This works. But so does the person in Africa right now who's sick as can be and has no hospitalization and is looking ahead and saying, what's next? The people in China who are being punished for their faith understand this glimpse of hope. No matter how dark it gets, hope brings light. So not only does Scripture give me hope, God's mercy gives me hope. 
God's mercy gives me hope. And I love this story. I'd never heard of it. I've been to LaGuardia Airport. Have you been to LaGuardia? It's awful. I'm just going to say that out loud. But the person whose name it represents was a neat person. He was the mayor of New York in the 30s and I think even into the 40s. And back in the 30s, <laughs> this is a pretty awesome thought. The mayor of a city could come into a courtroom and replace the judge anytime he wanted. So there were times he walked in and took over court. And so there were several stories about that. Some are kind of funny. But there's one story they've not been able to verify. But to me, it sounds like an awesome story. So I'm going to tell it. He came into court one day. Replaced the judge. And a lady came up who had stolen bread. And the fine at that time was $10 for stealing bread. $5 for almost any offense, but $10 for stealing bread. Or you go to jail. And so he sentences the lady, who of course has nothing. She's stealing bread. He sentences the lady to a $10 fine, which of course she cannot pay. There's no way she's going to go to jail. And then the judge gets his hat out, passes it around the courtroom, and does another verdict. Five cents to everybody here for living in a city where a woman has to steal bread. And they paid her fine. That's God's mercy. You don't deserve it. You can't do anything to earn it. You can't be smart enough or fast enough or Christian enough or go to enough church services or give enough money or be a nice enough person to earn it. So he rules a verdict which you can't pay, but then he pays the fine. Paul picks up in verse 5, May the God who gives endurance, by the way, you hear who gives endurance? God gives endurance and encouragement. This word for encouragement is where we get one of the words for Holy Spirit. It means helper, paraclete, lawyer. It could be somebody who fights for you. So this idea of encouragement, give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says, accept one another. And this word accept is cool in the Greek too. It means basically to take somebody's hand. You ever had somebody take your hand and say, it's going to be okay? You know, I told you a few weeks ago about the man at my dad's funeral who came up to me at the, after the funeral. And he, said, he, he stopped me, looked right at me and said, I understand what you're going through. My father did the same thing yours did. So I told his son, hey... I told that story about your dad, and he said, hey, here's my dad's phone number. Why don't you call him? He's about 90 years old. I called Mr. Hutchins and said, hey, I just wanted you to know how that affected me. And he just lost his wife recently. And so my call meant so much to him that now I had taken his hand and told him what was happening here and how he had encouraged me over all these years, and I had never forgotten that from over 30 years ago. Accept one another as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you, Christ has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Time out. Unless you're Jewish today, that's your verse. Jesus came not just for the Jewish people, he came for you. He was the Messiah, not just of the Jews, but of you. And so that's God's grace, which continues. Therefore, I'll praise you among the Gentiles. I'll sing the praises of your name, quoting the Old Testament. Again, it says, rejoice the Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up. One will arise to rule over the nations in him. The Gentiles, that's us, will have hope. See, Paul took a lot of flack as a very strict Jews, not only for, for not practicing Judaism with the non-Jews, which he was sensitive to, but for saying that they did not have to practice what he practiced. For saying they didn't have to follow the laws he followed. They now followed the law of grace. Have you ever woken up worried? You ever woken up freaked out? That happened to me this week. And here's what I love about waking up in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, you, I didn't mean for you to mop. I was going to mop between services. But you are so nice. Thank you for doing that. It's wonderful. We appreciate you doing that. Now go away. Stop working so hard. Making us all look bad. 
So I woke up in the middle of the night this week. You ever had that happen? Isn't it amazing in the middle of the night, the things you can imagine, the terror, the tragedy? Isn't it amazing how good your memory is in the middle of the night? Like you can't remember stuff all day long. You don't know what somebody's name is, but boy, you can remember something from 1984 that you did. With, with, and not only that, you can condemn yourself over it. You remember some tragedy that happened. Somebody yelled at you. Some situation that's coming up. Boy, you're, all of a sudden your mind is sharp at 3 a.m. In accusation and in failure and in fear. So I'm going to tell you what I did so you can do it. I did what I like to call the Acts Prayer. A-C-T-S. I took time. I said, adoration. I'm going to take time to praise God. God, thank you for who you are. Regardless of what my brain is deciding to do. I know you are sovereign over all. Very lemony smell, by the way. Very nice. Uh, you are sovereign over all acts. A. C. Confession. Lord, you know I fail and I falter and I mess up. And I, you confess whatever those things are. And even the things I remembered. Oh, Lord, you know I said that this week. I, oh. T. Thanksgiving. Lord, thank you. And then you just go through the thing you're thankful for. And then finally, supplication. You pray for other people. So I took time to pray for my family, and then I prayed for my staff, and then I prayed for each service, because I kind of imagine where you sit, and I prayed for Saturday night service, and then I prayed for first service Sunday, and then as I prayed for second service Sunday, I fell asleep, so they didn't get as prayed for as you guys did, so you're there. And I fell right back asleep. What happened? Because my hope wasn't in me, it, it wasn't in my failures, it wasn't in my fears, it wasn't in the things that were coming up. My hope is in Christ, and in Him crucified, and what He's done for me. So scripture gives hope. God's mercy gives hope. And then finally, his spirit gives hope. What does this song remind you of? Anticipation. Ketchup. Isn't that weird? That song reminds you of ketchup. Now that is an effective Heinz 57 marketing campaign. And here's what they were trying to teach you. Our ketchup is actually better because it doesn't come out easily. Our ketchup's better because you got to wait and maybe hit it on the 57. You got to wait forever because it's real ketchup. And boy, our ketchup's good. Anticipation. You're waiting for something to happen. And you know it's going to be good. That's what the Holy Spirit brings to us when he brings us hope. It's this idea of anticipation that God's going to help us make it through whatever we're dealing with. See, we think hope is about circumstances. And I don't know what circumstances you're in, but this year might be great and next year might be terrible. Or this year might be terrible and next year might be great. It's so wonderful living on a roller coaster, isn't it? And if your hope is only based on those times where the roller coaster is smooth, then you're going to have hope on the good days and no hope on the bad days. And the truth is, when do you need the most hope? On the bad days, on those tough days, anticipation. How does that happen? Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope, that word is in the Greek, anticipation, fill you, fill you. Listen. May he fill all your packages with all joy and peace. Does that describe you? <laughs> Not at 3 a.m., right? With all joy and peace as you trust in yourself. As you trust in your ability, as you trust in your circumstances, as you look at the future. No, no, trust in him. Why? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This week I found out something I never knew. It was really cool. I actually took a look last night. It's hilarious. My daughter's calling me in the middle of church, which is even funnier. Here's what I found out this week that I never knew. How many of you ever heard of some guy named Mick Jagger? Anybody heard of Mick Jagger? How many of you have ever seen a picture of Mick Jagger? Right? You kind of know what he looks like? Mick Jagger is touring the world. He was in Nashville recently. He was in Texas somewhere. He was, I think, in Atlanta. He goes out into the city to normal places where there are people everywhere. And he has somebody either take his picture or he takes a selfie. And there's several of him where there's people all around him. And here he is. And nobody's looking at him. Nobody knows he's there. He is Mick Jagger. You all could have... If he walked in this room, you'd be like, who is that ugly old man? Right? But you might think, he looks familiar. Picture after picture, place after place, nobody even knows he's there. Listen. We are that way with God all the time. The Holy Spirit is with us. Christ is with us. When you get to heaven... 
<laughs> and you say to God, where were you? He's going to show you the selfies on his phone. Look, I was right there. I'm right next to you. I'm walking you through that right here. Look, at here's the, here's the selfie picture that I took with you on that day that you thought you were all alone. I never left you. You just have to trust him on those days, even when you can't feel him. And what happens when you trust him? You begin to overflow with hope. And how does that work? Listen to this, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, which means he's in charge. He's going to handle it. He's going to take care of it. I may not be able to fix it, but he can. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your hope. What's the reason you're hopeful? But do this with gentleness and respect. What does that mean? It means when somebody doesn't have hope, you can't just walk in and throw the hope at them. You can't just walk in and go, let me give you a verse. But let me tell you what you can do. You can send them a text that says, I know it's been a tough week, year, month, lifetime. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. It could even be that you pick up this thing called a phone, which is it's an app on your phone that you can talk to people's voices. It's amazing. It might even be that you use this stuff called paper. That, that's the sound he's making, is paper. It might even be that you get a piece of paper and this thing called a pen or a pencil, and you write a note that just says, hey, praying for you. Maybe it's that you know somebody's sick, so you bring them soup. All of those things that you go out of your way for other people, you know what you're doing? You're carrying hope to them. You're saying, here's a little hope for today. And the only way you can do that is if you're overflowing with hope. And can I tell you about me? I don't overflow with hope all the time. People say to me all the time, oh, you're so happy. Oh, visit me on Sunday afternoon. Visit me when I'm tired. Visit me when I said something on Sunday that Sunday afternoon my brain goes, you remember when you said that? You are a doofus. I'm a doofus. So what do I got to do? I got to do all these things. I got to go back to scripture. I got to remember the grace God has on me, and I have to remember that His Spirit is in me and with me. He's taking selfies with me all the time and with you too. If you're a believer, He will never leave you or forsake you. Christmas is the season of hope. I hope this year that you'll be able to give away the present of hope to people who are struggling. Do it with compassion. Do it with gentleness. Don't just bust in saying, you need to be like me. <laughs> But bring hope everywhere you go. And let it overflow on other people. Be there for people. Text that person that you have not seen in a while. Email that person who you know is suffering. Call that friend you haven't heard from in a while. And please don't say the, well, they haven't called me lately. Well, maybe they've lost hope. So maybe it's time for you to bring them some. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to Christ. He died for our sins because we can't make it to God on our own. That's why Jesus came. That's the whole purpose of the Christmas story is to get to the cross. Jesus came to give us life because we couldn't make it. God came to us. We are the only religion where God comes to us, the true God. And so he comes to us, and that's what you can experience today. If you never have, you can surrender your life to him. Maybe as a Christian, the truth is you're struggling. Your Christmas hope box is empty. I want to encourage you to do these three things. Make that part of your life. And I pray, even if you'll take time to pray, to get still, to be grateful that God will refill your hope box and then you can give it away. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for the hope that's in you, not in ourselves. I thank you for the hope that you give us through this season and all seasons. Lord, I know there's people who are struggling this year especially. Lord, they've had loss, they've had hurt, they've had pain, they've got fears. Some are struggling with true depression. So, Lord, even in the middle of their depression, give them hope. Lord, bring people alongside of them to carry them, that we could carry one another's burdens and so fulfill your law. Lord, thank you for a group of people that are gracious and loving towards each other, generous towards one another, and that give hope to each other. We thank you for these moments today. In Jesus' name, amen.